Hello and welcome to This Month in Science. My name is Nicholas. And I'm Kristen. Today we'll bring you some fascinating stories, both domestic and abroad, ranging from paleontology to mental health to chemical ecology. Our first story of the day takes place at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, where scientists are learning about forgetting to learn. Cornelius Gross and his colleagues have been studying the first pathway known to science that actively tries to forget information. While experimenting with the hippocampus of mice, Gross discovered that when a main pathway was blocked, the mice were no longer able to undergo a Pavlovian response, which is when a certain sound is associated with a certain consequence, and the consequence is then anticipated. But if the mice had learned that association before the scientists stopped information flow on that main route, they could still retrieve the memory. But blocking that route had an unexpected consequence. The connections along it were weakened, meaning the memory was being erased. This was unexpected, and when they investigated the problem further, they discovered that activity in one of the other pathways was driving this weakening force. These findings were made using genetically engineered mice, but with some help, the scientists demonstrated that it is possible to reproduce a drug that activates this forgetting route in the brain without the need for genetic engineering. This approach, they say, might be interesting to explore if one were looking for ways to help people forget traumatic experiences. If you don't believe in monsters, now's the time to start. They lived on Earth long before the fossil record of dinosaurs and were discovered in 1958 by amateur fossil collector Francis Tully. Coined Tully monsters, these organisms looked like something out of science fiction. They were aquatic animals with tube-shaped bodies up to a foot long, skinny snouts ending in toothed jaws, and eyes at the end of short stalks like snails. For decades, scientists couldn't determine what types of animals these things actually were. They were categorized as soft-bodied invertebrates, with theories ranging from worms to shellless snails. But in a paper published in Nature, the team of scientists announced that Tully monsters are in fact vertebrates. More specifically, they're jawless fish similar to today's lampreys. Scott Lingard, Field Museum Curator of Invertebrate Paleontology, says it's a beautiful example of how science works to solve the mysteries of nature, and how museums fit in. The project relied on the museum's collection of over 2,000 Tully monsters as reference material for scientists to compare and analyze the animal's features. That's got to be the weirdest thing I've ever seen. My vertebrate zoology professor might be using Tully monsters in his lectures a couple of years from now. I wouldn't be surprised, and our viewers probably won't be surprised about our next story, looking at how many patients actually follow their doctor's orders. A conference was held this month at UAB regarding ways to identify hot topics and key research priorities around clinical treatment adherence and to foster collaborations toward this research. The talks included many speakers who are experts in their fields. Dr. Michael Sturrett, Program Chief of the National Institute of Mental Health Divisions of AIDS Research, spoke about the three most frequently observed failures to adhere to treatment, failure to fill the prescription in the first place, failure to take the prescribed dose regularly, and failure to take the prescription to its completion. Dr. Jeffrey Curtis reviewed data resources used to measure how well patients are taking their medications, and also described a learning system he is developing to let patients fill in their own knowledge gaps. Two other speakers presented information on federal funding opportunities for adherence research, and Dr. Rivetta Miko focused on conceptual models and behavioral frameworks to unpack the black box that persists between design intervention strategies meant to improve adherence. Proceedings from this conference are currently under development as a scientific research journal supplement. The Carnegie Institute for Science recently undertook a study to analyze the effects of ocean acidification on marine life along California's rocky coastline. Such studies are commonplace in today's scientific community, including here at UAB. However, this particular research project looked at four tide pools over five extensive sampling periods. In other words, a very large swath of data was collected. Two of the project's leaders, Ken Caldera and Lester Kwiatkowski, tell us that when carbon dioxide emissions are absorbed by the oceans, it changes the chemistry of the seawater and makes it more acidic, a process called ocean acidification. This breaks down calcium carbonate, which is what many marine organism shells and exoskeletons are made of. Because plants use carbon dioxide to undergo photosynthesis during the daytime, the authors found that the rate of shell and skeletal growth was not greatly affected by seawater chemistry in the daylight hours. However, during low tide at night, water in the tide pools became more corrosive to calcium carbonate. Kwiatkowski concludes that unless carbon dioxide emissions are rapidly cut back, we can expect ocean acidification to continue to lower the pH of seawater. I'm actually familiar with this kind of study. Doctors McClintock and Beige here at UAB study ocean acidification in Antarctica. Well, I'm sure we'll continue to hear about that and other environmental issues as the planet's situation grows more dire. For our final story of the month, we'll head back home to UAB, 
where research shows that older workers in sales and the service industry are at higher risk for heart problems. A nationwide research project called the Reasons for Geographic and Racial Differences in Stroke, or REGARD study, looked at 5,566 workers aged 45 and older who work in sales, office support, or service occupations. Fewer than 41% of the workers had a ranking of ideal in five of seven cardiovascular health factors, even though 88% were listed as non-smokers and 78% were credited with having ideal glucose levels. The study found that none of the older workers achieved ideal levels of cardiovascular health, mostly because of their diet. Co-author Dr. Suzanne Judd explains this by stating that achieving a healthy diet can be even more challenging for a person working 8 to 12 hours per day away from the home. This limits the time available to shop for and prepare healthier options. Lead author Dr. Leslie McDonald suggests that employees consider taking small steps to improve their overall cardiovascular health, including going on a walk during lunch or other breaks, taking the stairs instead of elevators, bringing health snacks to work, and drinking water throughout the day. This UAB-led REGARD study is ongoing and is sponsored by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, with over 30,000 enrolled individuals. Working in any of those three industries is stressful and difficult. I'm not surprised it takes a toll on older workers. I'm glad that researchers in public health are doing what they can to inform the community about the dangers of heart problems. Me too. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, I'm Kristen. And I'm Nicholas. See you next time on This Month in Science.